What is Julia Kristeva's idea of the object and the nature of women? Kristeva has emphasized the rejection of mothers by both male and female. Children due to male-dominated cultural patterns that render the mother herself abject. Which is to say, totally other, disgusting, and monstrous. Kristeva thinks that the solution to this problem requires a rediscovery and healing. Of narcissism in women's psyches and an acceptance of adult love between women. However, Chris Tava rejects the label woman as a universal term, and has refused to define women. She apparently believes that every woman is fundamentally different in how she is a woman or what being a woman means. As she wrote, it is there in the analysis of her difficult relation to her mother and to her own difference from everybody else. Men and women, that a woman encounters the enigma of the feminine. I favor an understanding of femininity that would have as many feminines as there are women. Christopher's main theoretical writings are, about Chinese women, 1977, Desire in Language. A Semiotic Approach to Literature and Art, 1980, Powers of Horror, An Essay on Abjection. 1982, Revolution in Poetic Language, 1984, and New Maladies of the Soul, 1995. Who was Nicus Polances? Nicus Palances, 1936-1979, developed a nuanced Marxist analysis of social class in late capitalist systems. Building on Antonio Gramsci, 1891-1937, he argued that elements of the ruling class have made strategic alliances with oppressed classes and successfully secured their ongoing consent such as with the American New Deal instituted by President Franklin Roosevelt. Palance's major works include Political Power and Social Classes, 1968. Classes in Contemporary Capitalism, 1973, and State, Power, Socialism, 1978. What are some important facts about Martin Heidegger's life? Heidegger was born in 1889 in the Black Forest in Meskirch, Germany. An area to which he maintained close ties throughout his life. He attended gymnasium, high school, in Freiburg, beginning in 1906, where he read Franz Brentano's 1837-1917, on the manifold meaning of being according to Aristotle, 1862. He intended to become a Jesuit priest, but he was rejected. So he prepared for the Catholic priesthood at Ludwig University in Freiburg. He read the works of Edmund Husserl, 1859-1938, their end. At the urging of his teachers, changed from theology to philosophy and mathematics. After marrying Elfried Petrie in March 1917, he joined the German army. Advancing rapidly to corporal, 
although he was discharged for reasons of health. As Hu Searle's assistant and a colleague of Carl Jaspers, 1883-1969, Heidegger was successful in philosophy. Becoming an associate professor at the University of Marburg, where he wrote Being and Time. 1927, in a matter of months to secure that post. After this work, he experienced the well-known care, or turn in thought, which led to his an introduction to metaphysics, 1953. Among his students were future philosopher Herbert Marcuse, 1898-1979, and political theorist and philosopher Hannah Arendt. 1906-1975, who became his lover before she had to leave Germany. As a Jewish intellectual, it became evident that she was in danger. After being questioned by the Gestapo the German secret police. During this time, Heidegger was influenced by Lao Tzu's work on meditation. Which led to his own understanding of being through language. Heidegger became rector of the University of Freiburg. In 1933 and was a member of the National Socialist Party. In 1945, the French military government removed his professorship. Although he was able to gain emeritus status, provided he did not teach again. He had a nervous breakdown in 1946 but wrote his letter on humanism to make it clear that Regarding his study of being, his work was not as humanistic as Jean-Paul Sartre. 1905-1980, and other existentialists had mistakenly assumed. In 1950 his professorship was restored, and in 1951 he was allowed to be Professor Emeritus. To recap, he was first given emeritus or retired status without having been reinstated as a professor. Then he was reinstated as a professor and was given a normal emeritus status after that. He continued his work until he died in 1976. What is hedonic calculus? According to Jeremy Bentham, courses of action should be chosen based on their consequences in terms of the pleasure and pain experienced by all involved. Everyone counts for one, and no one counts for more than one. All pleasures are on the same level, and in Bentham's famous words. All quantity of pleasure being equal, Pushpin is as good as poetry. Pushpin was a bowling type game of the time. The value of justice reduces to its greater utility over injustice. Punishment, for example is only just or unjust in terms of its consequences as a deterrent to future crime. Bentham's hedonic calculus consisted of literally quantifying pleasures and pains according to these factors. How near or far, how long-lasting, how intense. How likely to cause pleasure or pain of the same kind, and how many are affected. What were Søren Kierkegaard's stages of life's way?
Kierkegaard claimed that faith required choices in self-development through three stages on life's way. Each stage is a different viewpoint on life. First, there is the aesthetic life, lived in the moment. Dedicated to the satisfaction of desire, and, in its refined form, to the appreciation of the arts. Lacking in this life is commitment. Commitment is found in the second stage in the ethical life, which seeks a unified self over time. The third stage is the religious life. What are the highlights of Alfred North Whitehead's career? Whitehead spent the first 25 years of his teaching career at Trinity College, Cambridge. Whitehead and Bertrand Russell, 1872-1970, distanced themselves from each other after. Russell became a pacifist during World War I and Whitehead's son was killed in that war. Whitehead taught at the University of London and began publishing works on philosophy of science. Such as Principles of Natural Knowledge, 1919, The Concept of Nature, 1920, and The Principle of Relativity, 1922. His most important work as a process philosopher was Process and Reality, 1927-1928. Which was published after he moved to the United States to accept a position at Harvard. How was George Berkeley's occasionalism distinctive? Most occasionalists thought that the real causal connections between things took place in God's mind. Berkeley did not hold that view. According to Berkeley, we have ideas of sensory phenomena that are regularly followed by other specific ideas of sensory phenomena. But the idea of a causal link between them is an illusion. Did 19th century American philosophers directly take up evolution? Yes. Both John Fiske, 1842 to 1901, and Chauncey Wright, 1830 to 1875 believed in the evolution of consciousness and human morality. Fisk was best known as an historian for his two-volume The American Revolution, 1891. Wright was an empiricist philosopher of science who opposed transcendentalism and was to be influential in subsequent pragmatist thought, although he himself published very little. Lester Ward, 1841-1912, was a sociologist best known for dynamic sociology. 1883, but his main ideas in favor of intervention in social evolutionary processes proved to be relevant for future social and political philosophy. What is Aristophanes' comedy The Clouds and how does it relate to Socrates? Aristophanes' comedy The Clouds, 423b 
CE, is considered a satire of Socrates and other intellectuals of the day. In the story, Strepsiades is an Athenian who has been plunged into debt by his spoiled extravagant son, Theodipides. Socrates appears, suspended in air, and asks Strepsiades to remove his clothes before entering his thinkery. Socrates proceeds to relate his discoveries, which include the distance a flea can jump and determining if a gnat is whistling or farting. He insists that a vortex, and not Zeus, is the cause of rain. The play continues with absurdities such as Socrates stealing from a nearby wrestling school to feed his students. And insults to the audience in the course of a debate about new and old logic. At the end, Stepshadi's son, who has been schooled in the thinkery, tells Stepsiades that it would be morally right for him to beat both his father and his mother. The outraged Stepsiades sets the thinkery on fire and viciously beats up Socrates and his students. Some believe that the clouds contributed to the slander against Socrates that led to his trial and death sentence. But Socrates is said to have appeared on stage after the first performance and waved to the audience. And in Plato's Symposium, Socrates and Aristophanes are depicted drinking together and conversing in friendship. Why did George Berkeley like tar water so much? Some biographers claim that George Berkeley suffered the constant discomforts of constipation over his entire life, until finally, in late middle age, he found lasting relief in tar water which is an extract of tree bark. The following appears in a century of anecdotes from 1760 to 1860, by John Timms. Bishop Berkeley having received benefit from the use of tar water, when ill of the colic, published a work on the virtues of tar water, and a few months before his death, a sequel entitled Further Thoughts on Tar Water, and when accused of fancying he had discovered a nostrum in tar water. He replied, that, to speak out, he freely owns he suspects tar water is a panacea. What was Charles Pierce's fourth system? Pierce's fourth system, 1885 to 1914, introduced evolution to his second system. The whole system of sign-object interpreton, with its infinite implications, is an evolving system. The system has evolved over time and continues to evolve. As does our knowledge of it, and every sign within it. Pierce worked out many details of this process, in logic, and in what others considered pragmatism. He ended up with an extreme form of idealism that posited the entire universe as a living, feeling organism, with habits that are mirrored in our general laws of nature, descriptions of regularities. Who were the pre-Socratics?
The pre-Socratics, the term simply means those philosophers who came before Socrates. Came from outlying Greek city-states located on islands far from Athens, which was the cultural center of ancient Greece. Their ideas circulated widely among Greek intellectuals all over the civilized Western world. In chronological order, the main pre-Socratics were, Thales, C624 C546 BCE, Anaximander. C610 C546 BCE, Anaximenes of Miletus, 580 to 500 BCE, Pythagoras, C575 to 495 BCE. Heraclitus, 535 to 475 BCE, Anaxagoras, C500 to 428 BCE, Parmenides, ND, Zeno of Elia. C 490 to 430 BCE, Empedocles, C 490 to 430 BCE, Lysippus, ND, and Democritus. C 460 C 370 BCE. They were well educated men who had enough leisure time to ponder deep questions. What is a syllogism? According to Aristotle, a classic syllogism has a major premise, a minor premise, and a conclusion. If the major and minor premises are true, then it is not possible for the conclusion to be false, the conclusion must be true. For example, all men are mortal is a major premise. Socrates is a man is a minor premise. And Socrates is mortal is the conclusion. Why are Immanuel Kant's epistemology and metaphysics transcendental? To this day, philosophers dispute whether Kant was providing a theory of how the mind in fact works or instead a critical theory of how we ought to view knowledge. In either case, Kant's epistemology and metaphysics are both transcendental. His epistemology is transcendental in that he reasons a priori from what is known to what must be the case in order to account for what is known. And his metaphysics is transcendental in that what ultimately exists exceeds and eludes both our direct knowledge and full understanding. Even though we are justified in postulating it according to certain principles of reason. Who was Plotinus? Plotinus, 205 to 270, was born in Upper Egypt. At the age of 28, he began an 11-year study of philosophy with Ammonius Saccas. Andy. He left to fight with Emperor Gordianus Iiis, Marcus Antonius Gordianus Pius. Also known as Gordian III, 225 to 244, army against Persia. After Gordianus died, or according to some accounts was murdered. Plotinus fled to Antioch, but then settled in Rome. 
he founded a school in Rome, became friends with Emperor Gallienus, Publius Licinius Egnatius Gallienus, c. 218-268, and began writing down his philosophy. Gallienus intended to give Plotinus land to set up a community in accordance with Plato's dialogue. The laws, c. 360 BCE, but others intervened. And Gallienus was soon assassinated by his own officers in the midst of a competitive military campaign. Plotinus himself died two years later, it is said, from leprosy. Who was Queen Christina and why was she important in Descartes' life? René Descartes' second royal correspondent and student, Queen Christina, 1626-1689, of Sweden, was a less conventional figure than his other pupil, Princess Elizabeth. Although her philosophical skills and subsequent historical legacy were not as great, Christina's father raised her as a prince. And when she assumed the crown she took the title of King Christina. During her reign she greatly expanded the number of noble titles and extravagantly spent down the treasury. Most notably for New Sweden, a colonization of America in an area near Willington, Delaware. Christina abdicated in 1664, changing her name to Maria Christina Alexandra. She did this to convert to Catholicism, which was then illegal in Sweden. Maria Christina went first to Rome and then France. She enjoyed great attention as a former queen and was an active patroness of science and the arts. She was remembered for her shocking male dress, a short skirt, stockings, and high heels. Which allowed for greater freedom of movement than the long skirts women wore at the time. Greta Garbo portrayed Queen Christina in a 1933 film that was Highly acclaimed critically but did not do well at the box office. What were some of the rather humorous experiments carried out by members of the British Royal Society? The former British comedy troupe Monty Python would have had a field day. With some of the early investigations conducted by the Royal Society. And King Charles II, who was very interested in experiments in general. Loved to make fun of the more preposterous ones. For example, at the Philosophical Society of Oxford hosted by founding Royal Society Secretary John Wilkins. 1614-1672, who had written about the admirable contrivances of natural things in mathematical marvels there were, among Wilkins' own collection. Transparent apiaris and a hollow statue that spoke through a concealed pipe. Robert Boyle, 1627-1691, was considered eccentric because he doctored himself and seemed to make a hobby of collecting medical prescriptions. By the time the Royal Society had formed, alchemy had switched from being a science seeking to 
convert base metals into gold to one with an aim of using new medical discoveries to prolong human life. Nonetheless, in 1689 Boyle worked successfully to get Henry IV's law against multiplying gold repealed. When Margaret Cavendish, Duchess of Newcastle upon Tyne, 1623-1673, was granted a visit to the Royal Society in 1667, she was shown experiments involving colors, the mixing of cold liquids. Dissolving meat in oil of vitriol, weighing air, the flattening of marbles, magnetism, and a good microscope. The Duchess wrote in her own diary that the new science was useless for solving social and spiritual problems. Who was Nelson Goodman? Nelson Goodman, 1906 to 1998, criticized the idea that similarity existed in the world independently of our linguistic inclinations. Goodman was educated at Harvard, was an art dealer in Boston from 1929 to 1941, and became a Harvard professor in 1968. In his The Structure of Appearance. 1951, he developed Rudolf Carnap's 1891-1970, Insights about the Logical Structure of the World. Later, he came to the conclusion that there are many different world structures. Depending on the perspectives of observers. In fact, Fiction and Forecast, 1954, Goodman extended his argument that Structure in nature depends on our interests with his famous Gru example. Who was Hannah Arendt? Hannah Arendt, 1906-1975, was a German-American social and political philosopher who taught at the New School after World War II. She attended the University of Marburg, where she began the affair with Martin Heidegger. 1889-1976, that was to become a lifelong relationship. They broke up and came together repeatedly. Arendt wrote her dissertation on St. Augustine with Karl Jaspers, 1883-1969, at Heidelberg University. She was married to the philosopher Gunther Enders, 1902-1992, in 1929, but they divorced. In 1937. She was not allowed to continue her habilitation because she was a Jew. After beginning an investigation on anti-Semitism, she was questioned by the Gestapo. She then went to France, and worked with Walter Benjamin, 1892-1940, in helping Jewish refugees. Her own imprisonment at Camp Kurs ended with her escape. In 1940 Arendt married Heinrich Blücher, 1899-1970, a poet, philosopher, and former communist. With Blücher and her mother, she escaped to the United States from Vichy. France on phony visas, with the assistance of Hiram Bingham IV, an American diplomat. After World War II, Arendt testified for Heidegger in a denazification hearing. 
and she wrote an admiring essay about his work in a philosophical celebration of his 80th birthday. Arendt was director of research for the Commission of European Jewish Cultural Reconstruction, which led to frequent returns to Germany after 1944. In the United States she taught at the University of California at Berkeley. Princeton University, Northwestern University, and the New School. She was not particularly progressive in the American social context. Supporting racial segregation at the beginning of the civil rights movement. And refusing to be identified as a feminist during the period of women's liberation. Her main works are The Origins of Totalitarianism, 1951, The Human Condition, 1958. On Revolution, 1963, On Violence, 1970, Eichmann in Jerusalem, 1963, and The Life of the Mind, 1978. Who was Pierre Simon Laplace's most famous student? The man who would later become the most famous French dictator in history. Napoleon Bonaparte was one of Laplace's students. Laplace's definitive analytic theory of probabilities. 1812, was, in fact, dedicated to Napoleon. For what is Heraclitus still famous? Heraclitus is the author of the saying, you cannot step into the same river twice. He meant that human life and circumstances are in constant flux, like a river. How did Johannes Kepler and Tycho Ubra help complete the Copernican Revolution? Johannes Kepler, 1571-1630, composed a mathematically precise theory of the Copernican system, and Tycho Ubra, 1546-1601, furnished the measurements that constituted the factual data for the Copernican theory. Kepler's theoretical work was what completed the Copernican system. Kepler offered a religious explanation for the spacing of the planets and postulated a driving force centered in the Sun, which diminished with distance, as the cause of planetary movement. Who was Pierre Simon Laplace? Pierre Simon Laplace, 1749-1827, was a mathematician and astronomer who explicated what was to be the classic theory of probability. He taught in Paris at different schools, such as the École Militaire, military school. More develop his common sense philosophy? Moore's first major article was the refutation of idealism, which was published in Mind in 1903. 
in it he argued that no idealist or skeptical argument was as convincing as common sense beliefs that the world is real. And that, therefore, idealism and skepticism can just be dismissed. Moore became famous for proving the existence of the external world with his legendary two hands argument. Derived from his 1939 proof of an external world. Argument against skepticism concerning the existence of the external world. Moore said that by raising his right hand and saying, here is a hand. And then raising his left and saying, and here is another, the skeptical position was disproved. This was not as offhand a dismissal as it seems. Moore's premise was that he knew he had two hands. From which it followed that the external world existed. From which it followed that there was no ground for the skeptic's doubt about its existence. Who influenced George Berkeley? According to Berkeley, our ideas of sense are real ideas so long as we perceive them. And in our perception of them, we are doing no more than in some way participating in what God has created. In that way, Berkeley's notion of the world is an expansion of the doctrine of occasionalism. Propounded by Nicholas Malebranche, 1638 to 1715, in the 17th century. And brought to an epiphany by Gottfried Leibniz, 1646 to 1716, through his notion of pre-established harmony. According to that doctrine and Berkeley's embellishment of it, God does all the real work. From which we, because we have been created by him along with the rest of his creation, benefit. Berkeley thus extended the presence of God in human cognition. As something like a force constituting reality itself. Nonetheless, he endures as an empiricist due to his emphasis on sense data as a component. Of knowledge never mind that for Berkeley, sense data were not signs or indications of what philosophers and the vast majority of non-philosophers call an external world, or reality. For Berkeley, sense data were neither real objects in themselves nor signs of an external world, but ideas, created by God and placed in us. Period. Who was René Descartes? René Descartes 1596 to 1650 inaugurated modern philosophy with a pair of questions that persist to this day how are mind and matter different and how is the mind connected to the body he did not set out to invent these questions but encountered them himself while on the way toward trying to do something else he was trying to prove to the Catholic Church that rigorous philosophy was compatible with religion and that science could be both certain and compatible with religion. What kind of life did Ralph Waldo Emerson lead? Ralph Waldo Emerson, 1803 to 1882, 
lost his father when he was just eight years old. And was sent to Boston Latin School the next year. He attended Harvard College at 14. Where he waited on tables at the Commons and tutored to pay for his education. After graduation, he helped his brother in a school for young ladies, which his mother ran in her home. In 1829 Emerson graduated from Harvard Divinity School as a Unitarian minister. But he resigned from that vocation in 1832 because of a disagreement with church administrators. He had married Ellen Louisa Tucker in 1829, but she died of tuberculosis two years later at the age of 20. He mourned her deeply. But had also described himself as strangely attracted to a young man while at Harvard. And was later believed to become infatuated with other young men, including author Nathaniel Hawthorne. During travels in Europe after his wife died, Emerson met authors William Wordsworth, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, and Thomas Carlyle. He would correspond with Carlyle 1795 to 1881 until his death in 1881, and philosopher John Stuart Mill, 1806 to 1873. In 1835 Emerson bought a house in Concord, Massachusetts. And married Lydia Jackson, with whom he had four children. He was reasonably well off financially, partly due to a lawsuit securing his inheritance from his first wife. And he used part of the money to help Amos Bronson Alcott, 1799-1888, his neighbor. Many considered Emerson the greatest orator of his day. What were the goals of activist second-wave feminists? Equality with men in employment, an end to violence against women, full equality of women in public life. Including access to the highest offices of government, and top executive positions in all social institutions were all goals of the second wave. Full acceptance of lesbians and non-traditional families remain ongoing political ideals. As do universal health care and child care for working mothers in the United States. The problem of the second shift, or the fact that working women still do disproportionate amounts of domestic work and child care in their homes, is another overhanging problem. See in the second shift 1990 by Arlie Russell Hotchild and Anne Machen. What was the most striking Native American contribution to American philosophy? There is growing recognition of the influence of Native American thought on 18th and 19th century Euro-American ideas, as well as later on in history. Contemporary pragmatist scholars have traced contemporary concerns with community well-being in a pluralistic society to early Native American attempts to negotiate with Euro-Americans. Others have identified deeper mainstream American cultural debts to indigenous peoples. Robert Piercig, the author of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, 1974. In his second book, Lila, 1991, draws a fascinating and neglected comparison between 
what was to become the distinctly direct and plain American style of speech. If not always writing, and speeches in English made by Native American Great Plains leaders. Pearsig quotes Ten Bears, speaking in 1867 to other Native Americans and representatives from Washington. I was born on the prairie, where the wind blew free, and there was nothing to break the light of the sun. I was born where there were no enclosures, and where everything drew a free breath. I want to die there and not within walls. I lived like my father before me. And like them I lived happily. While pragmatists such as John Dewey, 1859-1952, were often prolix. Their writing was nevertheless direct and innocent of the high style of European abstraction and unnecessary embellishment. Their ideas were not unnecessarily complicated. The same can be said of much New England transcendentalist writing, although maybe not of the St. Louis Hegelians, of the more idealist pragmatists such as Charles Sanders Peirce. 1839-1914, and Josiah Royce, 1855-1916, or the process philosophers Alfred North Whitehead. 1861-1947, and his follower Charles Harchern, 1897-2000. Why wasn't Charles Pierce ever a professor of philosophy? Pierce did have a job as lecturer in logic at Johns Hopkins University. In Baltimore, from 1879 to 1891. But in 1883 he divorced Harriet Melusina Fay. To whom he had been married since 1862, and married Juliet Froisey. Froisey was thought to be a gypsy, and Pierce was said to have lived with her before their marriage. A scandal ensued, and Pierce left his academic position. Pierce's only subsequent employment was for the U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey, which ended in 1901 due to congressional curtailment of funding. Pierce then did odd jobs and was employed as a consultant in chemical engineering. Sometimes, William James, 1842-1910, and other friends assisted him financially. Who was Mikhail Bakunin? Mikhail Bakunin, 1814-1876, was a Russian anarchist and revolutionary who was active in Europe from 1840-1849 and 1861-1871, during the years between these periods. He was imprisoned in both Europe and Russia, and for a time was exiled to Siberia. His views are held to be contradictory because he believed both that the instinct for freedom in the masses would lead to revolution and that revolution would need to be the result of a plan by educated elite. In his first period, Bakunin criticized liberal projects to reconcile the demands of workers with the establishment. And he was particularly excoriating about both the church and the state. In his second period, he attacked scientism, or the dominance of technical approaches to public policy. 
calling for a revolt of life against science. Overall, Bakunin and his followers were opposed to the development of Marxism. What were W? V. O. Quine's most influential ideas. Quine did not think that the analytic synthetic distinction could be defended. Because he did not think that analytic could be defined in a non circular way. He had a holistic view of knowledge, likening the whole of all of our theories to a web. He believed that assertions of existence were relative to specific theories. And he thought that philosophical epistemology should be naturalized. By this he meant that philosophical epistemology should be consistent with standards for scientific truth. How are psychology and philosophy related? Up until the 19th century, no clear distinction was made between philosophy of mind and psychology. The science of psychology did not yet exist in its own right until the early 20th century. Early historical figures in the science of psychology, such as Sigmund Freud, 1856-1939, are of interest to philosophers because their theories of the human mind changed ideas about human nature in ways that philosophers had to take into account. Who was Johann Gottlieb Fichte? Johann Gottlieb Fichte, 1762-1814, is regarded as an intellectual bridge between Immanuel Kant, 1724-1804, and Friedrich Hegel, 1770-1831, as well as the founder of the 19th century school of German idealism. What were Friedrich Nietzsche's views on religion? In Beyond Good and Evil, 1886, The Genealogy of Morals, 1887, and The Antichrist, 1888. Nietzsche described Christianity as a sickly ethics of weak people's resentment of the strong. He thought that before Christianity blonde beasts had become Masters of their subjects through daring acts of ferocity. That ancient ruling class was naturally cruel to those not as strong. These fierce rulers saw their weak subjects as base, while their own traits of pride, courage, reverence for tradition, and loyalty to one another constituted their virtues. The old aristocratic system of values was in time destroyed through the machinations of a priestly class, which denied itself by turning its cruelty inward, and encouraged the oppressed masses to identify what hurt them as morally bad evil. Christianity was thus a slave morality in Nietzsche's opinion. 
its uselessness for living fully evident in the worship of a slain god and a rejection of earthly vitality for hopes of joy in heaven. He thought that Christianity was a powerless religion for powerless people. A slave religion with a slave morality for slaves. But he cautioned the strong, one has to test oneself to see that one is destined for independence and command and do it at the right time. One should not dodge one's tests, though they may be the most dangerous game one can. Play and are tests that are taken in the end before no witness or judge but ourselves. Did others share the mystical aspects of Nicolaus Copernicus system? In the late 16th century, Giordano Bruno, 1548-1600 A Dominican heretic who was burned at the stake by the Spanish Inquisition, developed mystical Copernicanism. Tommaso Campanella, 1568-1639, built on Bruno's ideas for a utopia described in City. Of the sun in which science was combined with astral magic for the good of mankind. What are the three waves of feminism according to feminist philosophers? The first wave began on the eve of the French Revolution with Mary Wollstonecraft's 1759-1797, writings and continued until women in both Great Britain and the United States were granted the right to vote in 1918 and 1920, respectively. After women gained suffrage in the United States. The women's movement seemed to go into a dormant period, perhaps because until the end of World War II progressive thought was concentrated on socialism and communism. However in the middle of the 20th century, the publication of two books began what many view as the second wave. The French existentialist philosopher Simone de Beauvoir's 1908 to 1986, The Second Sex, 1952, and Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique, 1963. Betty Friedan, 1921 to 2006, was an American writer and left-wing political journalist and activist. In 1957, at the 15-year reunion of Smith College, an institution for women, she interviewed her classmates who had graduated in 1942. Many had achieved the approved social ambition of a husband, home, and children, but they were dissatisfied with their lives and in some instances agonizingly unfulfilled. For Dan argued, in ways that resonated throughout American society and Europe, that women as human beings needed education and meaningful work, mental stimulation, and fully adult responsibilities. By the 1970s, further development of Ferdinand's ideas found expression in the third wave. The women's liberation movement was associated with the following achievements. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibited discrimination in employment on the grounds of gender, as well as race. The U.S. Supreme Court decision of Roe v. Wade in 1973 legitimized the right to abortion based on bodily privacy. These legal innovations combined with the pill, 
birth control medication, provided a new degree of sexual freedom. Huge increases in women's employment outside the home, and access to higher education. Women entered the professions in unprecedented numbers and the rest is history in the sense that it is now taken for granted by American society that women should have opportunities equal to men's. What was Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative? Kant is usually interpreted to have two formulations. First, act so that the maxim of your action, or the generalization describing it, can be willed by you to be a general rule to be followed by all rational agents. In other words, only do those things that you as a benevolent, rational being can will that everyone do. The test of a categorical imperative is what happens if everyone follows it. Something that has good consequences in a particular case might not have good consequences in all cases. For example, if the maxim is obey traffic rules, and you come to a red light with no other cars in attendance. You may not drive through it, even though the consequences in this particular case would be benign. Or, to use an example of Kant's, if the maxim is not to lie, and a madman is looking for a friend. Of yours whose whereabouts you know, you may not lie in this case. Because overall you can't benevolently will that everyone be permitted to lie whenever the consequences are good for them. To take another example of Kant's, you may not take your own life. No matter how miserable you are, because you categorically can't will suicide as a good action. What was Francis Bacon's New Atlantis about? Francis Bacon's New Atlantis was published in 1626 and went through 10 editions by 1670 in it was described the House of Solomon, a research institute with laboratories for experimentation and observation in the natural sciences to include, heat, light, cold, medicine, minerals, weather, crafts, astronomy, animals, and agriculture. There would be a staff of 36 fellows and their assistants, who would set out to make discoveries. Resident scholars would read written works on past discoveries. Three interpreters of nature would assess all of this information to construct axioms and principles. Who was Princess Elizabeth? This royal friend and student of Descartes was a powerful woman with an independent mind. Elizabeth, elect res palatine and queen of Bohemia, 1596-1662. Was the oldest daughter of James VI of Scotland and Anne of Denmark, his queen consort. Her descendants, the Hanoverians, were to occupy the British throne. In 1613 she married Frederick V, the elector of the Palatine. An alliance designed to strengthen her father's ties to the Holy Roman Empire. 
Her husband was only briefly king of Bohemia, however, and after his exile, they lived in The Hague. In 1649, she entered a convent in Hertford in Westphalia. In what is now Germany, which she managed until her death. Elizabeth's interest in philosophy had a depth that was unusual for someone with her social and familial obligations. In 1643, she wrote Descartes, and I admit it would be easier for me to concede matter and extension to the soul than the capacity of moving a body and a being moved to an immaterial being. For, if the first occurred through information the spirits that perform the movement would have to be intelligent, which you accord to nothing corporeal. And although in your metaphysical meditations you show the possibility of the second, it is, however, very difficult to comprehend that a soul, as you have described it, after having had the faculty and habit of reasoning well, can lose all of it on account of some vapors, and that, although it can subsist without the body and has nothing in common with it, is yet so ruled by it. What influence did Ludwig Feuerbach have on others? Feuerbach directly influenced Karl Marx, 1818-1883, and many others. His philosophical starting point of the existing individual predated existentialism. His ideas of how religion should be studied made possible sociologies, histories, and other non-religious studies of religion. What was the Bloomsbury Group? He Bloomsbury Group was a loose group of friends, the men of which were Cambridge graduates. They met in the evenings for drink and talk at the house of author Virginia Woolf's sister, Vanessa Bell. The house was in the Bloomsbury district of London, and hence this name. Its initial members, before 1910, were, the novelists E. M. Forster, Mary McCarthy, and Virginia Woolf, economist John Maynard Keynes, the novelist, biographer, and critic Lytton Strachey, and the painters Duncan Grant, Vanessa Bell, and Roger Fry. All were close or intimate friends long before they individually became famous. G. E. Moore 1873-1958, served as an intellectual ideal and mentor to the group. He was particularly revered by the others for his Principia Ethica. 1903, and the model of clarity he provided for all intellectual work. Above all, the Bloomsbury members were inspired by Moore's idea that art and friendship have intrinsic value they re good in themselves and serve no higher purpose. Has anyone succeeded in refuting Anselm's ontological argument? Many philosophers believe that Immanuel Kant, 1724-1804, killed Anselm's argument with his claim. 
that existence or being is not a predicate or a quality that a thing can have or not have. But other philosophers continued to debate both Anselm's and others' forms of the ontological argument. What was the Athenian school of Neoplatonism? The Athenian school was founded by Plutarch of Athens, 350-433, and carried on by Syrianus, c. 370-433. Whose most important student was Proclus, 412 to 485. This school was actually the same institution that had been Plato's academy. The Athenians added new levels to Iamblichus' system in the form of gods who were interested in philosophical matters and whose thought could be understood by mortals. Although they did not accept Iamblish's notion of two ones. What are some of Peter Singer's views? Singer, 1946 has at times argued that the lives of healthy adult animals are of greater value than those of severely impaired human infants. Such views have met with great controversy. When Singer was hired by Princeton University in 1999, there were dramatic public demonstrations by and for disabled people and the university administration hired armed guards to protect him. Singer, proceeding on utilitarian grounds, does not believe that animals have rights, but rather that their well-being is intrinsically good and their pain and destruction intrinsically bad. Singer is not a deep ecologist, because he does not attribute intrinsic value to the well-being of mountains rivers, or plants, or whatever is not sentient. Singer has claimed that the privileging of human life and well-being over that of animals is speciesism. Which, in principle, is no different from racism and sexism. What was the gossip about Thales? Not only did Thales rely on water or moisture to explain the universe. When Thales was not philosophizing, he was shrewd about practical affairs. In a dry year, after he predicted good weather for the next season's olive crop. He bought up all the olive presses. He was said to have made a fortune when the bumper crop came. And he was the only one who could process the olives into oil. It was reported, doubtlessly ironically, that Thales died of dehydration while watching an athletic event. Socrates, in Plato's Theaetetus, tells of the clever witty Thracian handmaid who mocked Thales when he fell into a well when gazing up at the stars. She said that he was so eager to know what was going on in heaven that he could not see what was before his feet. Socrates goes on to say, this is a jest which is equally applicable to all philosophers. For the philosopher is wholly unacquainted with his next-door neighbor, he is ignorant, not only of what he is doing, 
but he hardly knows whether he is a man or an animal, he is searching into the essence of man. How have second wave feminists addressed gender? They have criticized the social norm of compulsive heterosexuality. On the grounds that the human sex gender system is a system of power that benefits men at the expense of women. Some of this work has consisted of the deconstruction of gender as natural and a valorization of love between women. Judith Butler, the professor of rhetoric and comparative literature at the University of California at Berkeley, has challenged heteronormativity in Antigone's claim, kinship between life and death. 2000, and Gender Trouble, Feminism and the Subversion of Identity, 1999. Butler is famous for her deconstruction of gender into performances of gender. Sarah Lucia Hoagland, in Lesbian Ethics, Toward a New Value, 1988, and Marilyn Fry in The Politics of Reality. Essays in Feminist Theory, 1983, developed foundational views of this perspective. Who was George Berkeley? George Berkeley, 1685 to 1753, was the founder of modern idealism. Unlike his 17th century idealist predecessors, such as Nicholas Malebranche, 1638-1715, or Gottfried Leibniz, 1647-1716, he was not a rationalist. Berkeley was completely comfortable with science and empiricism in general and he significantly weighs in with the great triumvirate of British empiricists. John Locke, 1632-1704, George Berkeley, 1685-1783, and David Hume, 1711-1776. Berkeley was born in County Kilkenny in Ireland, where he went to Kilkenny College for four years. Beginning at age 11. He then went to Trinity College in Dublin and was elected a fellow there in 1707, holding the position until 1724. His first book, An Essay Towards a New Theory of Vision, was published in 1709, followed by the treatise Concerning the Principles of Human Knowledge in 1710. In 1713, he moved to London and published three dialogues between Hylas and Philonas, the first of his works to be well received. He was presented to Queen Anne by the renowned essayist and satirist Jonathan Swift. 1667 to 1745, and became friends with the literary elite of that time. In 1713, Berkeley traveled to Sicily as chaplain to the ambassador. His next position was as a tutor to St. George Ash, the Bishop of Derry, which involved further travel in Europe. He then wrote De Motu, On Motion, in 1721, as well as an essay towards preventing the ruin of Great Britain in which he argued that a recent financial crisis, the South Sea Island bubble, which was a stock market crash that resulted from over-speculation, was the result of a decline in religion and morals. 
In 1723 he received a windfall inheritance from Esther van Humrij. An Irish woman of Dutch descent who was a long-time correspondent and lover of Jonathan Swift, who called her Vanessa in his poetry. Berkeley claimed that she was a perfect stranger. In 1724 Berkeley was appointed Dean of Derry, which provided him financial security. But his dream was to found a Christian college in Bermuda that would admit Negroes and Indians, as well as white Americans. He raised money for the project, but not enough for it to become a reality. The British Parliament awarded him £20,000, but that money never came through. Berkeley married in 1728 and he and his wife, Anne, went to Rhode Island to set up farms to grow food for the prospective college. They remained there for three years, and then returned to live in London. He defended Christianity in the Minute Philosopher in 1732, and claimed that mathematics was more mysterious than religion in the Analyst in 1734. That same year, he became Bishop of Cloyne, which led him to move back to Ireland, where he remained until he died in 1753, while visiting his son at Oxford University.